Right, I'll make a start then, yeah? Yeah, okay. So, yeah, thanks everyone. I was asked to, if I could just give an overview of economic games, how we've used them in the past and how we plan to use them continuing on with the research and blood and organ donor uh, behaviour. So I'm going to do <clears throat> this. I'm going to say what games are and go through a few basic games. Um, I know Sarah said turn cameras and audio off, but if I'm as I'm going through, if things don't make sense or it's not clear, just, just stop and I can go back and explain. We don't have to get through all of this. It's just to give you a flavour of what we do. And then I'll just say, in terms of why games are important, what they predict, predictive validity, and how we can improve that prediction. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, how we've used them previously in blood and organ donor work, and then how we're going to use them potentially going forward. So see how we <laughs> progress with this. So economic games are designed to pick up what we'll call private or real world preferences. So preferences are people's sort of ordered beliefs about something in the world, how much they support something, if you like, or hold it. Now, true preferences can be influenced by things such as social desirability, reputation concerns. So if you ask somebody, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, um, if they're a nice person, of course they're going to say yes. We we know the sort of social norms and rules of interaction. So people always want to present themselves in a positive way. One thing we can do with economic games is, is to try and strip all those external constraints away and have the games played with strangers and completely anonymous, confidential situations. So you do, you're, getting at people, you're trying to pick up people's private through underlying preferences without any external constraints. So the experiments are always run anonymously, they always run as double blinds, as much as done as possible to reduce any external influence. We can then use games to identify real world preferences. And here we try to extend the basic private preference games to include parameters that mimic real world phenomena that we're interested in. Okay, so they have to represent the real world they're, they're not don't have to be exactly but they have to represent it in such a way to give the game ecological validity we have to show mapping to the real world phenomena and to do that we use often use post-game questions to check that people believe the game is actually assessing the real world phenomena we're interested in and can also see if the behavior in the game also maps on to uh, real world phenomena that we already know from sort of epidemiology data and it also means we have to know the community or the domain we're trying to understand in a, in a lot of details to be able to build those games accurately. So with that as a background, we've got this distinction between public and private. So private preferences and real world preferences. I'll go through some basic economic games. I, I'm assuming zero familiarity with any economic game. So that I will go through them and hopefully that they should be pretty self-explanatory. So some basic games. So the simplest game is a dictator game. So here there are two players, they're, they're complete strangers in the private preferences. They're, all the decisions are made anonymously in confidentiality. The experimenter doesn't know the decisions. The only person that knows their decision is the person that made that decision. So here the power resides with player A, the dictator. So player A is given uh, an endowment, a sum of money, let's say, for, or for purposes for all these examples, let's say 10 pounds. And they're told they can give some, none or all of that £10 to this anonymous other person, player B. In all these games, people are playing for real money. So it's not hypothetical what the decisions that are made are instantiated and um, acted on. So player A can decide to give some, none or all to player B. From sort of homo economicus, the idea that people are utility maximizers. There is no reason under complete conditions of anonymity for player A to give anything to player B. So the prediction is they should take the money and run. It's anonymous, they should take the £10. What you find is on average, people give about £2 in this context, give about um, a fifth of their endowment away. Okay. And then you can manipulate this game. You can make the rule, you can change the rules. So player B could go from being a stranger to being somebody you know, a family member. It, play it it could then be changed to being a charity it could be changed to being somebody from your community somebody from a, a, a an out group a different community to yours so you can then use that basic game to see how 
the change in uh, parameters influence the decision of player A. The automaton game is an extension to extent, uh, some extent of the dictator game. So here player A can give again some money and say they're 10 pounds to player B. However, the power in this game has now shifted and resides with player B. So player B gets the offer. So player B knows player A has got 10 pounds. I can offer them some, none or all of that money. Okay. And then player B can decide to accept or reject that offer. If they accept it, they both get whatever player A has decided to, to give in terms of division. <coughs> Excuse me, if player B rejects it, both player A and B get zero. Okay. So from that utility maximizing perspective, let's say I'm player A, let's say, let's say Sarah is player, is player B. If I offer Sarah 10p out of my 10 pounds, Sarah should take my 10p because Sarah is now 10p better off than she was a minute ago. Yeah. However, what happens in reality is people um, reject unfair offer so you can see on the graph just to the bottom here at the right when it's 50 50 i offer five pounds most people would accept it as the offers become more and more unfair or perceived to be unfair i.e less than 50 50 so down to 90 10 i keep nine pounds give the other person one pound people are more likely to reject it so people would sooner lose one pound to ensure that i lose five rather than accept the one pound so the automaton game, one of the arguments for why this behavior happens is it's a way of instilling fairness or expressing fairness norms, okay? So by punishing me for not being fair, I might be fair on my next um, encounter with somebody. And also people don't like to feel as though they've been treated unfairly and, it, and it's a way of um, sort of expressing discontent with that, okay? Trust game. So, a trust game is a, is a slight variant as we develop these sorts of games. So in the trust game, player A decides how much of an endowment to give to player B. Okay, whatever they give to player B, so say so we've got ten pounds again, is trebled. Okay, so if I give player B five pounds of my ten pounds, that gets trebled to fifteen pounds for player B. So the more money I give to player B is an index to player B. At, of how much I trust player B, because player B can then decide how much of that multiplied amount to return to me. So that's an index of reciprocity. And what you find in games like this, the nicer player A is to player B. So the more money player A endows to player B, which is trebled, the more player B will give back. And again, looking at the patterns of how people play this game out, and, uh, and again, you can alter um, the parameters in different ways. You can get indexes of trust in people and people's um, degrees which people are likely to reciprocate. So these are sort of simple dyadic bargaining games. The more widely used game is a public goods game. So this models a social dilemma between how maximizing your own benefits versus maximizing the benefits of your group or your community. So this describes the game. You normally put in, I'll run one through in a minute. You're normally in groups of four and you have a private account, say 10 pounds. You can decide how much of your private account to put into a public account. Whatever's put into the public account is usually doubled and then distributed back equally to more players, regardless of how much money they've put in. So the total amount that a player makes is the sum of their private account plus their public account. So I'll sort of do a little animation there, pretend that's me. I'm now in a, in a group of four people, so me and three others. It's anonymous. I don't know who the other people are. I don't know anything about them at all, and it's completely double-blinded, and we're all given some money, okay? And we're told the rule is basically we can take from our private account and contribute whatever we want from our private account to the public account. Whatever we contribute is multiplied by two, and divided equally back amongst everybody, regardless of how much everybody contributes. So if we've all got 10 pounds, and we all put 10 pounds into the public account, that's multiplied up 
by and divided back by everybody. So basically, we all end up with twice the amount. So if we all contribute everything to our little society, we all end up with 20 pounds and we start with 10. However, the temptation is to free ride. So here's me again. So this time I'm going to put in five pounds and everybody else has now put in 10 pounds. So the total pot in the public account is now £17.50, okay, which is now, it, sorry, it's thirty. It's £17.50 goes back to each person for the public pot, which means now I've got £22.50. So because I've got my £5 I kept back plus what came from the public account. So I have, in a sense, I have free road on everybody else's goodwill because everybody else has been 100% generous. And ultimately, now I've got more resource, I'm better off. OK, so that's the basic dynamic of the public goods game. How do people play that out over multiple rounds? And we can manipulate, again, the levels of endowment, degrees to which people know each other in the group and so on and so forth to see how um, we can change or manipulate or understand more about how people solve that dilemma of their self-interest versus um, self selflessness. And what we see in the public goods game is if you look at the red line, so this is a group of people playing a public goods game over 10 rounds. rounds the rounds are on the um, where it says time periods and the contributions are on the y-axis percentage of endowment. So you see people generally start off being quite generous, giving around about 50 to 60 percent away. Sorry, it's got a cup of tea. And then over time, people tend towards free riding because what you'll find is people are putting less. So people realize they're getting less back each time. So that follows on and people end up giving less. What the blue curve shows is if you instigate what's called second party punishments. And now you can punish people who don't contribute and you punish them at a, a fine rate of, say, one to two. So every one pound you decide to pay to punish them they lose two you see contribution levels go up massively or more so than when there's no punishment and up to a hundred percent by the end of it so the the argument here is sit we can see that free riding is likely to occur if there's no other um social norm introduced if we, if we introduce a social norm where we can enforce um cooperation through punishment of unfairness we see this massive increase in, um, in contributions and cooperation. So again, the simple games allow us to sort of try and model different ways in which we can um, increase cooperation. Here it's through punishment, but it could be through use of gossip or, or, or other sorts of mechanisms. Another key finding from economic games is the notion of conditional cooperators. So the conditional cooperators are the red line on this graph. The black dotted line is what would happen if people were completely um, fair. So what we've got on the y-axis is your own contribution in monetary units, MUS, and on the y-axis, the blue line, average contributions of the other group. And we see, and this pattern has been replicated in numerous studies now across the globe. And essentially, we find that around about 50% of the population are what's known as conditional cooperators. If they see other people are cooperating, they're more likely to say they will cooperate as well. They don't cooperate at, at completely one-for-one uh, one ratio. It's slightly less. They give slightly less than everybody else, but they cooperate. But interestingly, you'll see that 30% of the population free ride. So they give nothing regardless of what other people have done. So they completely free ride on other people's goodwill. And we can use these sorts of games to try and categorize people in terms of preferences and styles and then see how that plays out in terms of predicting real world behavior. It moves me nicely on to predictive validity, because one thing we want to be able to establish with these games that we can play in the lab or we can take into a field setting and play is do they have any utility? Do they predict anything in the real world that's got meaningful um, outcomes? For the people we're um, interested in understanding a little bit more about. So I'm going to give three very, very quick examples of predictive utility. So this is a study that was conducted in, in Ethiopia, 
And what they did here was they assessed people's um, conditional cooperation. So they go back, they used this experimental design to categorize people as conditional cooperators or free riders. You can see that along here, along um, the y x axis there, where you can see conditional cooperators are in red, weak conditional cooperators are in um, yellow, and free riders are blue. And then they looked at the extent, so then they use that to predict real world behavior. So these groups they were looking at, these are um, foresters in Ethiopia, and they are part of a commons, uh, forest commons management program where they basically have to look after a certain area of um, forest, grow new trees, manage the crops, and basically the amount of rent they pay and their timber quotations are based on the potential crop numbers per hectare, which is the number of young trees. Okay, so what we see from this graph is you can see the dotted black line is a sort of average point. The, the more conditional cooperators there are within each of these 49 user groups, the greater share um, of on the white on the axis here of um, uh, potential crops per hectare. Yeah. So if the groups are made up of higher levels of conditional cooperators, they are doing more to sustain their local environment in terms of um, the crops they need to produce, in this case, timber. They also looked at costly monitoring. So the time people spent going around looking at their area that they own or they're renting to check that nobody else is coming in and stealing their trees, cutting down their trees, so on and so forth. And again, you find groups with higher numbers of um, additional cooperators are much more likely to spend more time. This is in hours per month, so up to on average 32 hours per month um, compared to the free rider group, which is about 22 hours per month, an extra 10 hours or so monitoring. So we can see this very simple decontextualized lab experiment or lab way of developing getting economic gains, get preferences and divide people into these different groups does have some predictive, quite clear predictive utility in a real world context. Similarly, in this study, they did a public goods game. This was um, shrimp fishermen in northeastern Brazil. And they did a, a simple public goods game, looked at how much um, each of these fishermen contributed in a public good game that was done within their local community. And then about six months later, they went back and they measured um, the size of the holes in the nets they were using to catch the shrimps. Okay. And the argument here is if you use smaller holes, you're going to catch smaller, younger shrimp before they become fertile to reproduce. And in, and in so doing, you'll reduce the actual availability of your shrimp stocks for the future generations and for yourself in the future as well. So the larger holes are likely to allow the smaller shrimp to escape, the, the larger mature ones to be caught, and the crop, or in this case, the shrimp population, will maintain at a sustainable level. And again, as you can see here, people who contributed more high in the public goods game had on average slightly larger um, holes in their nets for catching shrimp. So again, those who have shown public goods game cooperation were also more likely to show real world behavior that was likely to lead to sustainability, both for themselves and people within their community. And a final demonstration of the predictive validity of these games. So, this is a study where people did a simple dictator game. And then, either four to five weeks or two years later, they were posted a letter that had been, that had been set up to look as though it had been misdirected to them and they had to return it. And what they found was basically that people, and that it had 10 euros in it. And what they found that people who were more generous in the dictator game were on average three to four times more likely to return the letter. So again, and that's over a two year period. So you think of this very simple dictator game done in a lab, do people donate some money or allocate some money to a stranger? predicting people's, in a sense, honest behavior two years later. 
So hopefully that sort of shows these get how simple these games are, but how they allow us to sort of close down and try and get people's underlying preferences and how looking at those underlying preferences have some utility in predicting actually how people act and behave in real world contexts that are actually meaningful for, for their survival, especially in the first two cases I've given you. Principle of aggregation, we can make that predictive power stronger by actually grouping together uh, people's performance across a number of games. So say we've got three games, game A, B and C, a dictator game, a trust game and an automaton game or dictator game, trust game and public goods game. We can have somebody play all those games. And what you would predict is somebody who is generous in a dictator game should also be more cooperative in a public goods game and should also be more likely to invest and trust the other person in a trust game. So we should see a positive association and that should lead to what people call the cooperative phenotype. We can identify people who on average are cooperative across a number of games. We can do it in a vertical way. We can have the same game, but we can alter how it's played. So we can have a dictator game to a stranger, a dictator game to um, a family member, a dictator game to a charity, and a dictator game to an overseas charity. And again, we should see if people are generous in one, they should be generous in the other. And then we can combine the two and we can have these multiple preferences. And indeed, that's what happens. So there's a large growing body of evidence now to show that's the case. So if you look at this graph and look at on the left as you look at it, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but hopefully you can, where it says PGG, TG1, DD, TG2, that's a trust game donator, trust game, reciprocator, dictator game, and public goods game. And these are all cluster and grouped together to give what's called a cooperative phenotype. And then other studies have replicated this. This again is a trust game receiver, which is TGR, trust game sender, TGS, and dictator game. And these all correlate on what's called load on or give a general factor, which is people who are generous in the dictator game are also likely to send more money in a trust game and return more money in a trust game and that's also across games so we see this cooperative phenotype and this cooperative phenotype also predicts real world helping so when it says game behavior predicts helping the helping game here proportion of helping was they recorded people's behavior on the on the um cooperative phenotype split people into defectors so people who didn't really help very much people who helped a little bit and people who helped all the time or contributed all the time in these dictator game and uh, public goods game and they looked at how much they helped an experimenter about two days later who was looking for help with another experiment and again we can see that positive association between performance on multiple games and willingness to help another person in the future. And it's been shown to influence people's, again, that cooperative phenotype, high correlations on these games. These games are all highly correlated with each other, predict phenotype, and that predicts, in this case, um, beliefs about climate change. If we look at preferences across a single set of games, we can see here the index at the end is the aggregate across eight different versions of the same game. As you can see, the aggregate predicts, in this case, blood donor behavior. Interestingly, and I'll come back to this in discussion, if you like, ec the economic games are quite good at predicting blood donor behavior, but, let, but don't predict voting, sorry, volunteering or donation of money. Okay, so how have we used blood donor, these games to look at um, blood donor preferences? So what we've been doing over the last 10 years or more, actually, and we're probably the only group that's doing this, is using economic games to try and understand the private preferences of blood and organ donors, as well as develop games to model um, blood and organ donor behaviour. So in this, these set of studies here, we have blood donors and non-blood donors, and they played a charity dictator game this CDG, so in the charity dictator game, we gave our donors and non-donors, in this case, they had two pounds in 20 pence pieces, and they could give some, none or all of that two pounds to a charity of their choice. And it was a real decision. So whatever money they gave to the charity, 
we wrote the checks and the money was sent to the charity. So they were giving money to a real charity. So as you can see in experiments one and two, charity dictator game at the bottom, non-donors, both donors and non-donors are generous and giving almost all of their way, but non-donors are giving significantly more away than blood donors. So they're both generous, but non-donors are much more generous when um, donating to a, a charity of their choice than, non -do than donors. But we had a hypothesis, a theory based on a lot of prior work that we've done that actually blood donors are warm glow givers. That is, they gain some personal utility, some warm glow from the act of giving itself, regardless of the outcome. So we set up what's called a warm glow charity dictator game. And in economics, this is achieved, economic games is achieved by crowding out the, um, the generosity. So how we do that is we go back to the charity dictator game. Our dictator, our person has now got their two pounds in 10, 20 pence pieces. They can decide again which charity they want to give it to. But we now tell them we have given that charity two pounds in 10 20 pence pieces and whatever money they give to the charity we will take away from the money we've given so if they give 40p to the charity we'll take away 40p from the two pounds we've already given the charity so whatever money they give they could give all two pounds we take our two pounds away whatever they give the charity can only have two pounds so that the act of donation itself is financially made null. There is no benefit of giving at all yeah, to the charity. And the charity, all the charities then has got two pounds at the end anyway. We, we're going to pay them anyway. So there is no reason to give other than to get some sense of warm glow, some sense of positivity from giving. So when we flip the game to a warm glow charity dictator game, we then see that blood donors now give significantly more than non-donors. So when the game becomes about personal utility, some warm, in this case, warm glow, we see this flip in behavior. So we get a behavioral signature to support all the other sort of um, psychometric and survey and interview work we had done previously with blood donors. So it gives us another layer of evidence that there is some, that warm glow is an important preference in a population of blood donors. We have done with blood donors and organ donors a thing called a third party compensation and punishment game. In this case, our blood donors and organ donors are player C, the orange figure head there. And they observe an interaction between players A and B. So player A has £10 and can offer some, none or all of that money to player B. And they see player A make an unfair offer, £2. Okay, we know that we perceived as unfair. There's, a wealth of literature from the automaton game and the dictator game. We know that people perceive that as unfair. And well, obviously we do a validity check on that as well. And then player C has got five pounds. And again, they're always playing for real money. And they can now choose to do one of four things. Nothing, take their five pounds and run. Punish player A. So for every one pound they pay, player A is debited two pounds. Compensate player B. So every one pound they spend, player B, who's been treated unfairly, gets two pounds. Or do a combination, do both compensation and punishment, which is obviously the most expensive option for player C. And because player C is not involved in this game, you know, you would expect that they should take the money and run. And what we find is people do compensate and punish. And we find that blood donors are more likely to show preference for compensation of the victim of the unfair interaction and organ donors have a preference to punish the perpetrator of the unfair action. So we see a clear distinction in preferences between um, blood donors and organ donors and compensation we know is linked to notions of compassion and punishment we know is linked more to notions of um, enforcing societal norms. In terms of Punishment behavior in terms of the now, this is different to a third party punishment. This is the ultimatum game. So, this is when you've been perceived as being treated unfairly, whether you accept the offer. And if you both, if you reject the offer, neither of you get any money. And we can see here that blood donors are less likely to accept unfair offers 
the non-blood donors, which again indicates that blood donors have a much stronger preference for norms of fairness and um, equity. And the final one I'll do is in relation to organ donation. So there's been an argument, and we've put the argument forward as well, that uh, posthumous organ donation is a costless behaviour, because obviously to the donor anyway, not necessarily to, to, the, to the families, but, but to the donor. So to, uh, this studies were done under when we still had opt-in um, policy. So we can see we had organ donor, people on the organ donor register and people would not play either a dictator game, standard dictator game, give some money to another person, a stranger, or what's called a generosity game, where we give the, do the, the dictator player A a fixed amount that they're going to get anyway. In this case, it was five pounds. And then they could offer something above that. So they're now being generous because they've got a resource. It's making, in a sense, it makes their donation relatively costless. And what we see is the organ donor, those registered versus those not registered, no difference under the dictator game, but a significant difference under the, the generosity game or the game where the, um, the, uh, the cost of giving has been reduced. So again, it indicates that the private preference, at least amongst them, those registered as an organ donor uh, for more costless generosity. So uh, just a little snapshot of the types of studies we've done. Hopefully that gives a sense that you can use these games to try and dissect and pull apart the sort of private preferences of blood and organ donors in a way that you couldn't by asking um, survey questions or, or interviews. Okay, so can we then set up games to model blood and organ donation behavior in the real world? Yes, we can. Now this is an horrendously complex slide and I do apologize because these games then become quite complex because we're now trying to model real world behavior but this is a game that we developed and have published to look at organ donor behavior and under different conditions of feedback but essentially we set people up in groups of three and they're either told they're in an opt-out situation so they're all registered as donors and can opt out or they're in an opt-in situation where they're all registered not as a donor and they can opt in and we play this over rounds where they start off initially playing as an, under an opt-in and then we change the policy to opt-out. So that mimics how in most countries the policies have changed from opt-in to opt-out. There's an experimental control. We have it going the other way as well. But our primary interest is moving from opt-in to opt-out. And people can then make a decision to join the register or leave the register, depending on whether they're under opt-in or opt-out. And... There is a cost for joining the register. So they, they have a, a monetary endowment, but they have to, every time they join the register or if they remain on it, if it's under opt out, they, it costs them. Okay. Because there's obviously a psychological and behavioral cost of joining it or leaving any register. And without individualistic feedback, they're not told what other people do until the end of the experiment. And with individualistic feedback, they're essentially giving feedback on each round. And then there's an earnings phase, which I'm not going to talk about in detail here, where there's a chance of A and B units, which represent different organs failing and then can be used for, for transplant. And depending whether you're on the register, you have an option of um, being able to receive an organ and live longer and remain in the game and uh, earn more money. But what we're interested in is, rather than, I'm not going to talk about the different hypotheses we've used to test on this, does this game pick up some of the basic real world phenomena that we would see in um, posthumous organ donation? And I uh, clear this slide is, but yes, it does. So we see that on average, registration rates are higher under opt out than under opt in, which is what you would expect. And under individualistic feedback, we see that under an opt in condition, yeah, this is when people get feedback after each round, so that nobody else is doing, you see higher registration rates. And this corresponds with what's been known as the Facebook effect. So they ran a large randomized control trial in the US where people had an update status on their phone on Facebook to say they'd registered as an organ donor. So that's individualistic feedback. And what they found was when people could do that and update their registration status, the number of people registering as an organ donor under opt-in in the US 
uh, went up dramatically. So we mimic two of the key epidemiological findings that have been um, shown in the literature. I'm going to skip the next slide. I'm happy for those that want to, to talk about it. That's just going through differential effects of different types of feedback. But I think for the purposes of what I want to talk about today, we don't really need to go into that. Um, just, I just want to show we can get a game that does work. And this is, we've now developing a game to model living um, donation, living kidney donation, which we're just running first studies on now. And we are developing a game in a similar guise to model blood donor behavior. And these games take a long time to develop. So this is in its early stages. So I'll be interested um, in your feedback. So say, for instance, that organ donation game, that's probably that took us probably about a year to develop. And the opt-in and the living donation game we've probably been working on for well over a year off the back of the deceased one to get it right. But this is basically how this one works. We're an eligible donor pool. And from that, we'll set up smaller communities of 10 people who will play around over 20 rounds. We randomly selected. There's a potential that you, in this game that you can need blood, not get blood, and that can lead to you leaving the game in this in the, in the sense that you, you you die, you don't get enough, you don't get blood to treat you, and then you're replaced from the eligible donor pool. So the community always remains at 10, and people receive a point for every round, and each point is worth 20 10p or something. So they'll end up with two pounds. So if they're a non-donor and just stay, don't ever register, they will end up with the maximum amount or a amount of money, but they run the risk because there's a probability that they might need blood. And if there isn't any blood, and they don't get transfused over three rounds, then they leave the game and they end the leave with nothing. So that's to model the idea that this notion of future reciprocity that people are donating partly to ensure that there's a sufficient supply of blood. And if nobody donates, there is no blood. So it allows us to be able to model scarcity. There's no reciprocity. You can, if you receive blood, you can't donate, which also models what happens in the real world. There's independence of rounds. So if you donate one round, you don't have to be, don't have to. So if you register to donate and donate one round, you don't have to in another round. And then you can in the round afterwards, again, just like in the real world. It's a cost to donation which are going to vary from being small to high, depending on what happens to you when you donate from very little inconvenience through to feeling to model and well two points. And they will happen at specified probability that matches the probability of those events happening um, in the epidemiological data that we already know. Blood will have a shelf life, because we know it doesn't last forever, so it will last for one round. We're debating whether that might be two rounds. And then there'll be a need for blood. So there'll be a probability that one of the players will need blood, okay? And that will either be a small need or a large need. And they will be transfused if there is enough blood available. If there isn't for three rounds, then they will leave the game and that'll be, the, that'll be their end and they will end up end up with nothing. So it's, it's, it's trying to pull together all the features that, we could, that are in normal blood donation and put it into a, into a game context that can be played over a number of rounds. And this allows us to test novel hypotheses. So we can set up something. The nice thing about games and experiments is we can set up things in the lab that, we, that can't happen in the real world. So we can set up a situation where somebody can donate but can never receive. So, you know, this model, pure, pure altruistic preferences, okay? So in, in the standard condition, people can both donate and receive. And obviously, once they receive, they can't donate. But in this context, even if they haven't received, they can't donate. So would they continue to act as a blood donor if they knew they could never benefit from it? We can combine preferences. We can look at people's warm glow preferences, their conditional cooperation preferences prior, and then have them play the game and see if different people who bring different preferences to the game test in different ways. We can rapidly test different interventions to see if they influence people's um, registration or donation um, patterns. I've got an eye on the time. I'll, I'll do one more, two more slides, and then we'll finish, which should leave about 15 minutes for any questions. And economic games allow us to test new ideas or novel ideas or old ideas in new ways. So in this game that we've done, which I've or study which is called the blood money study 
we have people play this dictator game or a charity dictator game under four different frames. The standard one, which I've just talked about, where they've got some money, they've won some money on the lottery and they can donate, okay? One, where they've actually earned the money themselves and can donate. One, where they're told they've been paid cash to donate blood. So this is just hypothetical frames and they can choose how much that to donate. And one where they're told they've been given um, a gift voucher for donating blood and how much they can donate. So this is set up to test the idea that there's some notion of in, that blood donation has an intrinsic motivation that people do because it's an intrinsically good thing to do. In which case, when you get given money, you should donate it all away. You should distance yourself from that donation. Um, we've run this study, <clears throat> studied and run reasonably globally. We've done it in a number of different countries and aggregated data across those countries. And that's what we see. We see when the endowment is framed around money and cash for money a higher proportion of people um, want to give away but that is still only around about 60 it shows that 40 percent of people blood donation is not an intrinsically motivated um, behavior and that's important as we start to think about incentives for donation and particularly incentives around um, plasma donation so again we can use the games to try and pull out um, and get more precise estimates of um, people of preferences around blood and organ donation that we just couldn't get from from any other method. So it's not saying economic games should be used instead of it's another tool in the arsenal to actually I uh, work out donors' preferences and motivations. And if it all works well, th it should correspond with what we know from survey and interview data, but give us much more precise estimates and I think I didn't do a slide that said thank you but thank you uh, so hopefully that's given you an idea of what these games are how we've used them in the past and how we intend to use them in in the future so I'm happy to take any questions or comments